You know, I think I tried to write this sermon about a thousand times this week. Wednesday or Thursday morning, I was sitting with Jeff Whitney in my office trying to plan out the contemporary service, and I told him that I didn't know what to say anymore because I'm torn. I don't want to stand up here Sunday after Sunday addressing every tragedy that happens in our nation and in our world. And yet I feel that a part of what we're supposed to do as a church when we gather together in worship of God is to struggle sometimes. Struggle with where we see God in the midst of a messy and a sometimes scary and a sometimes darkened world. It'd be easier to stick our, our heads in the sand and pretend that because it's Christmas time, maybe just for one hour a week, we can pretend that everything is all right in the world and things aren't horribly messed up. But that isn't what we're called to do as a church. And it isn't what we see people in the Bible doing either. John the Baptist goes into this messy and scary world and he proclaims Christ's coming. Christ then is born into this darkened and scary, messy world as well. And it's in that world then that he does his ministry. He doesn't turn a blind eye to the suffering around him. He confronts and meets people there. He brings healing and brings peace in the midst of it. He doesn't ignore it. He doesn't pretend it's not there. Jeff and I talked about how it's so ironic that this Sunday is supposed to be the Sunday that we talk about peace. And we talked about John Lennon's Christmas song where the frame goes, war is over if you want it. And how poignant that is. And we wondered if it was true. And then what it looks like if we decide to live for peace. Lenin asks over and over again in that song, and so it's Christmas, and what have we done? And I guess the thing that gives me hope as I, as I try to process everything that's, that's going on in our world and try to make sense of it in the light of my faith, and as I try to see our world through the lens of Scripture, as I try to faithfully follow Jesus through the scary places, is that the world that Jesus was born into, this world that John the Baptist proclaims him coming into, this world that our Savior begins to do his ministry is a world that, like ours, it didn't have peace either. In fact, the gospel writer of John, when talking about the coming Christ, doesn't even give us a nice Christmas story. But he says that the world was darkness and that a light was going to shine in that darkness and then the darkness wouldn't be able to overcome that life. And he says that John the Baptist then comes to testify to that light. And to be honest, with you, I like his interpretation of it much better than Luke's, especially after weeks like the ones we've been having. You know, tonight at 7 p.m. our time, the president is going to address the nation in the Oval Office. They say it's only the third time in his entire presidency that he's talked to us from the Oval Office. Usually he's in the East Wing or, or in other places of the White House. The last time he talked to us from the Oval Office was to actually tell us that they were ending operations in Iraq. And I have a feeling tonight it will be to tell us that we're going to battle with ISIS. I don't have any inside knowledge of that, obviously. The president didn't call me and consult me, despite my pleas to him to do so. But they are reporting that he said he's going to address the terror threat. And so our day starts here, together, gathered in worship, gathered around a table where bread will be broken and the cup will be poured, and somehow God's grace comes flowing out of it. Then later today, some of us will gather around tables here again to celebrate the Christmas season in, in fellowship with one another. 
And then our day will end listening to the scary situation of the world in which we live. A world that we can't hide from. A world that we have to confront and deal with and live in as people of faith called to faithful living. And yet somehow I find myself relying on the hope of last week for the peace that we're promised this week. Because the truth of the gospel is that it's the dark and scary situations that our Lord is born into. And it's through the bread being broken and the cup being poured out where we find God's grace flowing the fullest. And somehow then during this Advent, I I can feel myself watching and waiting perhaps more than any other time for, for small signs of peace. For small signs of light shining through the darkness. For small signs of God's grace and the coming of our Savior. I don't know. I mean, maybe this whole John the Baptist message to us today is that right now, maybe more than ever, we need to be people who are proclaiming the coming of peace into our world. In a time where the media outlets want to focus so much on what's gone wrong in the hatred and violence that permeates our world. Maybe then our job as Christians, especially in this time, is the point to and lift up the people who are working for and making peace even louder. Maybe our job is to testify to the light louder than the people who point to the darkness. The Reverend A.J. Must once said that there's no way to peace. But rather, he said, the way is peace. And that our job then is to live into that peace to be beacons of peace in a world of terror. I think that's what John Lennon meant in his Christmas song when he said, war is over if you want it. John the Baptist is telling us that the Prince of Peace is coming, and he tells us then to prepare the way for the Lord. And maybe our jobs then are to do just that, to prepare the way for the salvation of God by both lifting up the peacemakers and by becoming ones ourselves. But I I will admit this. I do find it terribly difficult to be a peacemaker in the face of such inhumanity. And when I hear the reports of and, and see the videos of what these ISIS people do, my blood boils and my heart breaks. And my mind does go to thoughts of retribution. And it becomes tempting then to hate people that I've never met. And the peace that I want so desperately in my life and in my world then gives way to violent thoughts. When I hear of people creating acts of terror in my country, whether by crashing planes or shooting up office parties. My mind doesn't jump to peace. And war being over isn't always what I want. Sometimes peace isn't what I want at all, if I'm totally honest with myself about it. But yet when I stop and I breathe deeply, and I unplug from the news and I pick up my Bible. When I spend time in deep prayer. And when I spend time playing with my children. When I come here and gather in worship with you and struggle with God in my faith. When I take time to reflect on not who I am, but who I want to be. It's then that I realize that all this violence and hatred and terror that we see in the world, it doesn't have to continue with me. And I'm forced to ask myself then this really hard question 
that John Lennon asks us over and over again in his Christmas song. It's Christmas. And what have we done? I'd like to think that I'm preparing the way of the Lord. I'd like to think that I'm living into the love that Jesus calls me into. And that I can hold my conviction in that love, even at the risk of my own death. I'd like to think that I'm living in a way that contributes to the peace of this world rather than taking it away. Because I know that, that my peace, and the peace of this world, and the peace that Jesus offers me through tables like this one are predicated on my ability to push away hatred and embrace love. And I also know that as good as that sounds, it can be terribly difficult to do sometimes. To push away hatred and embrace love. And where there are people these days who are judging others by what religion they follow, I'm not so comfortable in doing that. Because I can't start letting myself hate someone because they believe differently than me. Especially when it seems that the very problem seems to be that the terrorists hate us because we believe differently than they do. I know that I cannot have peace, at least not the peace I want, by hating other people. I'm not saying that I have to condone their actions. I'm not saying I have to believe as they do. But what I'm saying is that I'm starting to believe John Lennon when he says war is over if you want it. I'm starting to believe A.J. Musk that peace isn't the destination, but peace is the journey. And that peace is the way. I'm saying that I believe the gospel that sometimes when life seems its darkest, and themes seem the most broken and the most scary, that it's in these moments we see Christ coming into the world most clearly sometimes. And God's grace is most noticeable when we realize how dependent on it we truly are. And Lord knows we need God's grace now. And so it's our job as Christians that in this season of Advent, this season of anticipation, both in the life of the church and in the life of our world, this time where things seem so uncertain, it's our job then to be John the Baptist to this world. It's our job then to proclaim the Prince of Peace and to prepare His way by living as peacefully as we can, both with our inner lives and with our outer lives. One of the ways that we prepare for peace, even in the midst of war, is through prayer. And through gathering around tables like this one. And breaking bread together. And remembering God's grace to us. And God's promise to be a light that shines through a darkened world. And so it's Christmas. And what will we do? We'll pray for communities like San Bernardino, communities all throughout the world where shootings and bombings become common occurrences. What will we do? We'll recommit ourselves to being messengers of God's peace. And we'll gather around this table and we'll embrace God's grace. And we will not give in to hatred. But we will remember that our Savior who was born into a darkened and violent and scary world is again born into our world when people of faith like us live into his love. So let us pray. God, we pray for those leaders of our communities, our, our church, our country, and our world. That 
they may make decisions that are in accord with God's commandments that bring life, justice, and peace. We pray for those who have died by actions of violence. That they may be raised with Christ who died for them. That they may know the unending life and glory of the kingdom of peace and light. We pray for those who have survived violence. That they will be sheltered in the compassion of God in our community. And that feeling the compassion of Jesus, they may find healing and hope. We pray for those who commit acts of violence against others. That their hearts may be moved by Christ's grace. And that they may be transformed by the spirit of love. And we pray for ourselves. that we will work together to end violence and bring life, peace, and security to our world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.